before we begin, I just want to make sure, because yesterday we had some trouble with these head mics, and I want to make sure that mine, I'm, I'm the only one wearing one, taking the risk of wearing one, that everyone can hear me. Okay? Great. I'm so glad. We've had the most wonderful first day, and I'm really happy that we're rolling. We're kind of greased on the road, uh, because I have the advantage of having people who've already been here and understand what the format is and how we're going to work. For about the first half hour, we will talk among ourselves. We've already been talking for an hour upstairs over our nice little breakfast. And then we're going to open it up to all of you. We have mics. Uh, you've been told that by Karen. And we want to have the full discussion with everybody. We have so much that's interesting going on. And um, so welcome to all of you. And I will introduce everybody briefly. And I want to get them all right. So I wrote it. I have it written down. Kiku Adato. She is a scholar in residence at Harvard University's Mahindra Humanities Center. Uh, Yanis Varakis, the Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist. You've seen his photos everywhere. You just didn't identify with the little tiny credit, but I always look at little tiny credits. And I've seen him, his before I ever met him last year in Doha. Sunny Bergman, who uh, is from the Netherlands, and she's a documentary filmmaker and activist. Vada Kanfar, who uh, is uh, from Palestine, wherever that is, whatever it means. Um, Co-founder of Common Action Forum and the former Director General of Al Jazeera, which made a great change for us in the media landscape. Uh, Al Jazeera generally, and then when it became Al Jazeera English, made a tremendous uh, contribution, I think, to the way in which we were able to look at media and have media. And Nadil Ibrahim, who is the uh, founding uh, executive director of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and co-chair of the Africa Center. We have had a wonderful chat already over our yogurt and buns in, upstairs. And uh, we're in the middle of our conversation, really. So I'll just kick it off a little bit by saying that for me, home is a very interesting concept because I had it taken away from me. And I realize, and I echo Margaret Atwood's statement yesterday, that we are old. Uh, Margaret Atwood and I are at exactly the same age. We went to university together, and we remember the Second World War. I guess that's what it means to be old. Uh, and also the Korean War. And, um, uh, the uh, 1948 war in the Middle East and the assassination of Count Foka Bernadotte and all those things we remember, we were children. And so basically, um, I think that we, ta we take a view of our country and our world which is a little bit more uh, distanced. And I take a view of it which as I grow older, I realize has had this m most enormous effect on me, which is that of having been a refugee and having come to Canada as a refugee, having lost everything, having been completely displaced, and not knowing where you're going. This is one of the interesting things about being a refugee uh, who gets transported somewhere, that you don't know what your destination may be. And that is where I identify totally with the people who are in those boats going somewhere, because they don't know where, if they say, oh, we want to go to Germany, we maybe would love to get to Britain, uh, but they really don't know what the ultimate destination is. In a way, it's counterindicative to the European m overriding myth, which is the Odyssey, which is Homer. Because at the end of the Trojan War, Odysseus, who has been the great hero and is the wily person, s goes home in a very, very, very circuitous fashion he has a home and he doesn't go to it. The Odyssean myth is that you have a goal, but you make your way towards it slowly. And when you get there, you recapture it totally. You say to your wife, what have you been doing while I've been away? You hang and kill all her maids because they might have witnessed what she might have been up to while you were away and she might not have spent her whole time weaving on that loom. You kill all the witnesses, and then you say to your son, who hardly knows you because you've been away all that time, hey, this is really boring. Let's get going again. And off they go. 
So home is only the temporary thing in the basic European myth and mind. And that comes from the Greeks, okay? So you know that. Um, for me, it is always going to be, where is your home? How have you established it? And for me, home was, of course, my little tiny family, my mother, my father, my brother, and me, and our making our way in a completely strange society, except that it was part of the British Empire. And being part of the British Empire meant there were red post office boxes, and there was Tate and Lyle syrup for sale, and cow and gate milk, and those things made my mother feel at home, because she had been a colonial in Hong Kong, she was a colonial in Canada, and that was, in a way, safe. How does home reverberate for me now? I don't know really. I feel at home in many places. I feel at home in France because I went there young. I learned the language. I became part of the culture there. I feel at home in Canada, in Toronto, in my hundred odd year old house and on Georgian Bay uh, because that is the essence of our Canadian landscape. But do I feel completely settled? And I have come to the conclusion, as Margaret said yesterday, we're old, that I'll never feel at home anywhere. But I will feel that I have a place and that I have a safe, there's a safe place. And I feel completely safe. So that's where I am coming from. And I know, looking at Vada, that you are part of the largest refugee group in the world. You are a Palestinian. There are 4.7 million Palestinian refugees. Where is home for you? What does home mean to you? Thank you very much. I do believe, I mean, thinking about myself personally, of course, Palestine was my, I mean, I was born and still my home. But the point is, I find that the word home for me is not an accomplished project. It's not some, it is a process in making. So wherever I have been, and I have been to many countries, I lived in South Africa for a long time, in Sudan, in Jordan, right now in Doha, in Qatar, in Istanbul, in Turkey. Wherever I go, I find an element of what I can call home, and that is added to this grand overarching theme of what home is. So in my opinion, the home is the place where you are getting the best out of it. Justice for me is important. Wherever there is more justice, where there is more dignity for me to, to, to feel, wherever there is like-minded people who struggle for values, that maybe, find, maybe define for me this closeness to what I call home, leaving it from geography or you know, moving away from geography into much more virtual and much more value-centered uh, you know, a style of what I can call home. What about you, Kiku? Um, you're writing um, a book right now called The World Next Door. So are we next door to where we should be? Uh, or do we have to be at home to be next door to something? Uh, yes, I think that there is a sense of an interplay between being home, having a place in the world, and having a sense of who is next door, a curiosity of, of the people who are near us. But when you mentioned the Odyssey, I was, wanted to tell the story of my own sense of home, which is a sense of more than a place, a journey. Uh, Odysseus took a journey, um, and my own family took a journey. My name itself is a, a journey. My first name is Kiku, Japanese. I was born in Japan, my last name Adato is Spanish and Italian, and that points to a story I'll tell in a minute. And all my life, I moved, beginning in Japan, then New Jersey, and San Francisco, and Austria, speaking different languages, always moving different places, because my father was a historian in the army, and my father's from Istanbul, Turkey. He was an immigrant to the United States. So the story, the deeper story of home, for me, is about memory, again a journey, because um, as Sephardic Jews, and this is very common, our family kept their key to their home in Sevilla, Seville, Spain, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So when they were expelled in 1492, during the Inquisition, they traveled, our family did, 
um, through the Lower Mediterranean and ended up in Constantinople, Istanbul today, where they lived for over 400 years. But in their home, they always spoke Ladino, which is 15th century Castilian Spanish, just frozen in time, pure Spanish. That was the language of home, always, whatever country. So in Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, my family spoke seven languages, but only one language was the home language, the language my father learned in his home and spoke when the family came to the United States. So he lived in a little cocoon, and before he went to school, all he spoke was this 15th century Spanish. So this idea of the key, of the return, of a sense of home where you are not, but it is in your memory and it is constitutive. It makes up your identity. So 500 years later, in 1992, my father took the whole family onto his smallest infant grandchild back to Spain. And my husband, Michael Sandel, is asking me, what is this return about? <laughs> you were thrown out during the Inquisition. You were given the de decision to either convert leave or die. People were burned at the stake. What is this meaning of return? Isn't this some crazy form of nostalgia? And I answered that no, because the sense of home, a place, the key to a house we never lived in, never saw, was essential to our story. And what I draw from that for all of us, whether we have a very strong geographic sense of home and homeland as the people do of the First Nations in Canada, where this is your home and it's connected to a sense of place and nature and gratitude and welcoming, or whether you're always on a journey. It's the sense that we have to consider home like an archeological dig with multiple layers. And we can't look at somebody's house where they're living now and make any conclusions about the deepest meaning of home to them. A house is not a home. A house is a shelter. A home is a feeling. It's, a, it, it's something that, that encases you, whether or not you have a physical house. And you've talked about language. And I think the idea, uh, Sunny, that we had in Canada, in, in my generation, Margaret Atwood's and mine, uh, we were very close to the Dutch because we had liberated them uh, during the Second World War. And we had stories, I was a little child then, but we had stories of how we must welcome the Dutch to Canada. They were among our first big wave of immigrants post-war because they had starved and ate tulip bulbs, these lovely flowers that we knew, and they had been so hungry that when the Canadians came to liberate them, they ate tulip bulbs, but that they were a wonderful people, very clean, and they washed the sidewalks in front of their house, they were so clean, and they washed the windows every day. And uh, so we had this image of the cozy, the home, everything. Is it really like that? Exactly, <laughs> eating, still eating tulip bulbs. Um, <laughs> no, um, I'm, I, I don't recognize your idea, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Don't clean my windows very often, I have to admit. Um, no, so, uh, of course, there is an idea of the Netherlands, but there is the reality of the Netherlands. I, I must say, because I, I was listening to your stories and it brought up all sort of associations of, of home, and I realized I've never felt home in the Netherlands, actually. And Why not? Why? You're blonde. You're not blue-eyed, but you're very blonde and you're very pink and white. You're perfect perfect Dutch person. No, but most Dutch people are very tall. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I grew up, my mother is English, I grew up in a very um, alternative uh, environment. We lived on a boat, we had our own electricity, we had our own vegetables. We were, we were considered like gypsies by the rest of the uh, village, so the people saw, uh, saw us as outsiders, and my mom always said whenever we went to the village, like, that's where we have to eat with fork and knife, but at home we'd, you know, walk around naked and sing songs, so I've always felt um, kind of very different <laughs> in the kind of bourgeois society because we were so different, so I was realizing that home for me is that boat. Whenever I dream, I still dream of that boat, and that, so in a sense, and a boat can move everywhere 
where you go. I used to imagine as a child that there would be the, uh, Holland would be flooded, and then all the people who had, had made fun of me, I could like rescue them on that boat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the Netherlands at the moment, the reality of the Netherlands is not this blonde clean um, image that you have of, of pe people cleaning their pavement. The reality in the big cities is that 50% uh, of the population... 55, zero, uh, five zero, you mean five, 50%? Yes, something like around that figure, is of, uh, uh, has a bicultural background. So is not blonde, probably, or not white, at, for, uh, at least. And the reality is also that a lot of uh, people that that are like white Dutch people cannot accept this reality. So the place that they call home, they feel it's being threatened, and this is being um, like this fear is being pushed by politicians. So I think that there is at, at the moment uh, the Netherlands is there's uh, very much in transformation. Hadil, um, where is home for you? When one looks at you, one can say. Ah, uh, where are you from? And then you open your mouth and you speak and you think, ah, uh, where is she from? Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> so to, uh, to answer that question in a very literal sense, I am a Londoner. I carry a British passport. I'm absolutely European. I'm African. Um, all of these identities I hold at once. Um, I think most people on meeting me assume I'm Indian or of South Asian origin. And fascinatingly, when I say I'm African, they assume I'm Indian East African, which I'm not. I'm black African from a tribe called the Nubian, the Nubian people. Nubians. I'm Nubian. That was the area that was flooded for the Aswan Dam. Exactly. Yeah. So um, perhaps something I have in common um, with my Palestinian brother Wada is this notion of a homeland that's inaccessible, and in the case of the Nubians, our homeland was flooded, it's submerged, it's under the water, so there is no possibility of return. Um, and on a side note, maybe that's something that will become more and more common when you look at um, Paci Pacific Island nations like Kiribati, they're facing the imminent submersion, and if you look at what the president of Kiribati has done, migration with dignity, they've bought land in Fiji, the young people will be retrained and migrated, and the old people will be allowed to die with the ancestors. So that notion of um, a submerged homeland is something that will become more common. But really what I wanted to say about home relates to uh, this idea of what, what is a home when you have no connection to a physical place, mm -hmm. right? So um, echoing what Kiku said, it's really moving to come here and encounter an indigenous narrative and be in a country where people acknowledge um, the stewardship of the land and all the public events we've been to, hearing that acknowledgement is, is, is incredibly moving, but speaks to a different type of identity to my own constructed sense of home. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if, if you'd permit me, indulge me, I wanted to quote a great Viennese essayist, Alfred Polgar, who said, and I, forgive me if I get it slightly wrong, that um, it's the destiny, of, the destiny of the immigrant is not that the foreign land becomes home, it's that the homeland becomes foreign. And I find that incredibly moving because I think in a lot of the conversations this week, um, even in the extraordinary lecture on Monday, the idea of states as fixed things and people as moving is slightly undermined by the experience of my parents and my generation or actually countries are changing more than people are. The values of my family have remained pretty constant, but the, the countries in which we live, their values seem to be fluctuating quite rapidly. And if I could give one example, recently I was struck by a documentary on, on BBC World about, about um, British Jews whose families had fled Germany in the 30s in search of a new home. And post-Brexit, they were going back to Germany to get German passports. And they were having to reconcile whether their grandparents would be ashamed of that or not and, 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 and what that meant to them. And to me, it just seemed that Germany in 2017 maybe represents what Britain represented in 1937. That is, home is where you're allowed to express your values. Home is where you are allowed to be yourself. And the geography of that may change, may change very rapidly. Um, and so how we, 
how we conceive of home in a way, maybe, to me, maybe mine's closer to where that home is where I'm allowed to be myself. And I have to be flexible and mobile about that. Um, that's the reality in today's world. Janis. You, you are very Greek. I mean, I look at you, I know you're Greek. Um, little <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And, um, and you, so therefore you are rooted in something, but we met and we, uh, last year, and, and uh, I wanted you to take part today because I feel that you are very, very rooted in your country, and yet you go everywhere and look at people who have no countries, who have no places to be. And uh, how does that affect you as somebody who has had the privilege of being rooted, and you're going to go home, and that will be to Greece, and that is your home, and that's always been your home. Right. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so first of all, I want to make a statement. I think if you, everybody uh, looks back in, in their roots, for maybe a hundred years, you'll find out that you, we all have some uh, refugee or migrant blood. I certainly have a lot of refugee blood from my grandmother. My mom's mother was from uh, Izmir, an ethnic Greek who had to um, flee in 1922. And I grew up listening to her stories. Um, the other thing I want to say is that uh, in, in my boss, calls me a nomad. <laughs> um, also, I want to say that in Greece, in ancient Greece, Greek was not the, somebody who was born in Greece. So it was somebody who spoke Greek and he was educated mm -hmm. the Greek way and believed in the Greek gods. We had a lot of gods. Um, now, for me, I, as I said, you know, I... I, all my life I travel, and um, I remember my mother was telling me stories. My father was in the army, so he moved from place to place, and I, uh, I changed in, within uh, 12 years, nine schools. And, um, but uh, what you said earlier uh, about uh, Odysseus, um, I was always kind of related to, this was my hero and the quest, and the voyage, and his Ithaca. His Ithaca, the island of Ithaca, was his, his home. But it, wasn't, it was about the, the voyage in life, and what he, you get, and uh, you know, how you, you educate yourself and through all this, uh, through this quest. So I tell you what, if you ask me what is home for me, home is a place where my heart beats slow when I feel comfortable, when I feel safe, when I feel that people love me and nobody's going to backstab me. Because I've, you know, usually I'm in terrible places. Uh, covering, and yesterday I was, I was telling that, uh, you know, my mission is to be out there and become the voices of those in need and in uh, wars and all this, and also become your, your eyes and um, out there. So, yeah, I would say home is where my daughter is, and, uh, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable staying at home for too long because I feel I have to go out there and, you know, meet people, and that was always my, my, my thing, uh, to go around. So I would, sometimes I would say, well, you know, I'm, uh, um, I live in Earth. Uh, that's my thing. Earth is my, is my home, and I think everybody's home is Earth. I think that um, we've had a, a nice round here, and there are many things that can be picked up. I want to hear, we want to hear from you in the audience, so put up your hands. We have our wonderful uh, microphone box here, our little six-degree box, and we also have other microphones. So hands up. Yes, Aziz. Yes, Aziz is my name. Uh, for me, home is where my wife is with me and I get breakfast. <laughs> this morning there was no breakfast, so. Uh, no, home. Uh, someone who has lived in nine countries and 11 cities, have traveled over 100 countries, was a chairman of the refugee board and have dealt with the Afghanistan crisis, uh, had about 100,000 refugees in the camps, 
And for me, their home was when they wake up in the morning and they were safe that day, away from bombs, away from crisis. So for me to see them happy, that was home. So now that changed my life. And for me, home is where I can go and help someone. For me, help is somebody I could send them to school. That is home. So really, home is uh, for people of us who have traveled around the world. Problem after problem was born where parents had no money to send us to school, where they had no money to pay for the hospitals. So we see the value of that home very different. So I think Canada is a country Madam Clarkson, you are uh, last night to watch that movie was just outstanding. Those who are there will appreciate what a great movie is. So, so I think to me, if I had a chance last night to speak about refugees, I think we have the mo best model in the world in Canada, and that is Madam Clarkson herself, <laughs> who came as a refugee and can be the Governor General of Canada. So I say to those refugees who are coming as a baby who wants to get out of those camps, yes, you can be the prime minister of this country. Come to Canada. They will give you a space to move and make this home. So really, home is uh, everyone's definition is different. It is remarkable with the talent people sitting here telling us about the home. For me to help those Afghan refugees for four years full time, Madam Clarkson, I was at the Vancouver airport the other day. And as I'm going through the security, the, the lady at the security kept looking at me. And finally, when I made an eye contact with her, she asked me if I know her. And she definitely looked somebody from Afghanistan. So I said, I'm really sorry I don't know you. She said, I was a little girl in a refugee camp where you used to come and tell us to learn English language so Canada can help you. So when I learned English language, I came to Canada. And today I'm the head of the security at the Vancouver International Airport. <laughs> that was a refugee from Afghanistan. So thank you. For me, home is somewhere where you can go and help somebody else. Really, that is home. Thank you. Thank you. Vada, I, I know you. I, Vada, I know, I know Vada has a comment on that. Yes. And then thank we'll you very there. much. And I, of course, I salute you for this magnificent spirit. You brought up Afghanistan. It brought back to my memory as well great emotions and thoughts. You know, I have seen a lot in this world. I have seen a lot of blood and wars. I have covered almost every conflict during the last 20 years in Africa, in Asia, wherever it happened, and in the Middle East, of course. I was brought up in a family as well, where my father couldn't see his sister for 20 years. I have not seen my brother, who is second to me in the family, I'm the eldest, for 25 years, for now, as a Palestinian who was not able to go back and he was not allowed to leave. But the issue is, and I've seen in Sierra Leone, in Congo, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, things that the humanity really should be ashamed of because of all of the above mentioned. So I discovered with time that the moment when you as a human being uncover in yourself the possibility to feel that you are crying with the people in Sierra Leone or the child of Sierra Leone enslaved by a gang, or you are actually feeling emotional about a, about a person displaced from Afghanistan, or you are standing for justice in Iraq or in Palestine or wherever it happens in the world, that is the moment when you have elevated yourself from this generational trauma that you speak about, about or from this kind of being part of, of, of this simplistic definition of what we are, you have become then a human being, a human being embedded with values. And these values are not algorithms, are not materialistic, are not opportunistic, are not pragmatistic. They are values of what we are. And this is then what I call a real home. This is my home, is my spirit, my belonging, my values, and the liberation of us liberation and the breaking of the chains of, of belonging to materialism and belonging to, to this solid entities which we call sometimes interest. I just want to pick up something before we go to the next question again that you said, which was that your homeland becomes foreign. 
And that, I think, was, you crystallized something for me that I've been thinking about for some time. Because when I was growing up and, and later, and even now, people will often say, what do you think about China? Or how do you, do you feel, you know, do you, do you like China? Or don't you miss it? Or why don't you speak Chinese? Or, or any combination of those things. And what I would say is that I don't feel that. Like you, I don't, you, you feel British. Your culture is British. I feel Canadian. That is my culture. I know what my background is. I know what it, where I've come from. But I don't, I don't identify with it. I think it's an interesting part of myself. And I think I do not deny it in any way, but it's not the thing that makes me feel comfortable. You know, I can't say I feel good because I am a Chinese person. I feel it's interesting that I am a Chinese person, but I don't think that it is my defining characteristic. And that's what you were saying. But the homeland becoming foreign is, again, one step a little bit f further than that. And I, and I think we have to think about the weight we put on people when we classify them according to what they've lost or what it isn't anymore. So in many cases, if you, were, if you talk to my parents, as, as, uh, or certainly my father is a Sudanese, the Sudan of his memory is not the Sudan of today. And so somehow, and I mean, I, I would wonder if some of the Syrians sitting here feel the same way, that the Syria they grew up with is not this Syria. So I think that's an extraordinary act of, 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 we call people by what they've lost, and I think there's something deeply sad about that. Yeah. Yeah. But I would add to what well, that said, you know, again, the, the, the great Roman African poet, Terence, said, I am human, so nothing human can be foreign to me. Terence, Roman, yes, actually, from yeah. North Africa. From North Africa, from North Africa. yes, African and a former Roman slave, exactly. and a former slave. But this idea that because you're human, nothing human can be foreign, I think is really powerful. And, and um, to a point we discussed very quickly earlier, people like Wada, myself, many of us in this world, have one foot in the West, one foot in the East, or one foot in the North, one foot in the South. That's an extraordinary thing that we wrestle with on a daily basis. And I think our countries, our systems don't utilize that. I think the world would be very different if more of the World Trade Organization, more of the UN, were composed of people who have kind of surmounted the cognitive dissonance of assuming that to be African and European is to be in conflict. It's not. I'm that every day. I can see a way forward that's constructive. So I think this notion of kind of duality can in the modern world be incredibly, incredibly valuable if people value that or choose to value that. We had a question over here. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi, Danny. Hi. Uh, so yesterday somebody asked me if I feel at home here in Canada. And Danny is a Syrian refugee. Danny is a Syrian and refugee. And now Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yesterday somebody asked me if I feel here, uh, home here in Canada. And I said sometimes because, and while I'm going to sound stereotypically gay, while I have a lot of friends in my living room and we're watching RuPaul's Drag Race, I feel at home because we're giggling and having fun. And sometimes when I came back from Europe and the uh, visa officer stopped me while let everybody else uh, in and asked me 26 questions, I counted them before they let me in back to, to Canada despite having a permanent residency, I don't feel at home. And I feel at home when I think about Syria. You were talking a minute ago about how when you think about, uh, I think about my memories there and I think about my upbringing there. So I feel at home there but it's, it's, it's a home in my memory. It doesn't belong on, in real life anymore. It's not somewhere on the map that I can point out. I feel at home when I think about Egypt because I grew up in, uh, I, I lived for seven years in my teens in Egypt. And I feel at home when I go there and, and when I go there in my memory and I think about Cairo and my friends there. So I guess what I'm saying is that I'm not monogamous when it comes to home. <laughs> I can, I can have multiple homes at the same time, and I'm totally fine with that. That's how, as someone who came here to Canada in my early 30s, who grew up in Syria, who grew up in, in Egypt, who grew up in places that don't exist anymore, um, that's how I'm trying to come to, to, to terms with my seeking of home. And hello, my name is Andreas. I'm actually on the board of the ICC. And once upon a time, I was a gay SKP from my birth country, from Greece, Yanni. 
to this beautiful land. And uh, the only thing I want to offer here is that my ideal definition of a home is a place that doesn't define you, but instead allows you to define it. And that is the beauty of the homeland we've created here in this country. I just, <laughs> good catch, Marty, good catch. I have a question here, a question there, and a question there. Hi, my name is Emma. What a beautiful conversation about the meaning of home and identity. It's caused me to reflect in the last um, few days a lot about um, the people, you know, so many people in the world who have such a hard time coming um, to grips with what is their identity. So I, I just want to speak a little bit about the 140 million orphans in the world who, for whom, you know, it's very difficult to know their identity. And here in Canada, we have about 75,000 children in foster care, and about a third of those are from Indigenous communities. And I was actually um, started life as a ward of the state, and so I've kind of had my own journey with this question of identity to the point at which it's like, you know, I'm kind of jealous to look around the room and hear everybody say, you know, I'm this and I'm that and I'm from here and I can hold all of these things. And, um, you know, there's many people in this country who will never really get to say with certainty, um, especially under Canada's closed adoption laws of the 80s and 90s, you know, really quite where we come from, but absolutely consider Canada home and I'm very proud to hold many of those heritages, uh, but just wanted to put in a word for those who may never be able to say, I'm this or I'm that. <laughs> just, just before uh, you uh, get up with your question, I want to put out one that maybe somebody can answer. Um, is there anybody here who is an American who feels that somehow they are not at home anymore. Just leaving that with you in case there is anybody, we would love to hear from you. We haven't heard from many Americans uh, during these last two days. So the next question. So my question is about um, the, the conversation around what, how you claim, how you come to claim a place as home. Um, my question to you is, there is a difference between saying that I am home and the home that you are claiming to be home, permitting you to say that, and permitting you and reinforcing you and supporting you in saying that. Can you speak a bit about that dissonance that that creates in the person who is claiming a place as home and the, how that journey is navigated from the, the microaggressions and the questions of justifying how you come to place, claim this place or all of these places as home? Sunny has a... Well, yes, interestingly, we were just discussing at the breakfast, you were saying that one of the only places you, if I may uh, quote you, that the only one of the only places you don't feel home is Europe. And that comes back also to this uh, research I've done on what it means to be white. And I think as Western countries, we, the, the dominant culture is this white culture that has in itself a very... Uh, a very, uh, an idea of superior, su super, su how do superiority. You put it? Yeah, superiority. So um, I think what we need to do is to educate white people to change that idea, because what we are seeing now that we have a, a whole um, group of people that are second-class citizens in their own country. You see it in all, like they get lower um, uh, advices on what, what uh, education to follow. There's discrimination in the, mar on the, in the labor market. So these are uh, prohibiting people from really building their home in the country that is supposed to be their home. Uh, yes. Two responses here. Okay, Rob. Question. Yes, yes, my, oh yes, you would have a question. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question for the, for the panel is, and this came up briefly in one of the panels yesterday, uh, it used to be that asking someone, where are you from, was an expression of curiosity and interest, whereas today many people feel that that question is a gesture of exclusion that should be avoided. And I'd like to know what the participants in the panel think about that. Is it, should we not ask people, where are you from? 
I don't think, I, I mean, if I can go first, because I've been around the longest probably as a foreigner, in, originally a foreigner in a country. I've been here for 70 years since I was three. Uh, no, 75 years since I was three. And, um, and so people always did ask, where are you from? And there was, it's tinged. You know, it's, there is a curiosity. It isn't malign, necessarily. Uh, sometimes it's kind of, you know, uh, they just don't know. And, um, and it really, during the war, people didn't ask us because they, they knew we couldn't be Japanese since they were the enemy, and they weren't really quite sure, and there weren't that many Chinese in the little city that I grew up in. And so they weren't, you couldn't be placed. Nowadays, I don't know, I'm all, I ask people, where are you from originally? Because I'm interested, because we are a country where everybody, almost everybody's from somewhere else originally. And whether or not, whether or not that's tinged with animosity, or simply curiosity, or whatever, I don't, I don't think we should be making a big deal of it. I think it's really uh, upsetting for people to say, I don't want people to say, where are you from? Well, sometimes they're just interested, or they're ignorant, or whatever. Why can't you handle their ignorance? But it does display, display a friend of mine uh, um, uh, who is black said to me what it really means when people say that, why are you black? Why are you black? Yeah, well, I, you know, that may be, that may be, and, and I think uh, that that feeling is simply the Because he says, I'm English, and they say, no, no, but where are you really from? My, I mean, my husband is, is, is non-white, and he gets it all the time, and he makes a point of saying Groningen. That's a city <laughs> in the north of Holland. And, you know. Yes, and that stops the conversation if you want to. And then they say, but you're so exotic. And it's, I mean, it's kind of, it displays an, uh, an uh, not being used to this reality that is actually... Uh, but I think we have to be very careful yeah. between bad manners, ignorance, and a kind of, why are you here, kind of thing. You know, I think really there's a gamut of all of those things. And I think we, as people who come to a country where we are not understood or where we're at, we have to have an element of forgiveness in our, in our approach to the people who are ignorant. That was my father's yeah. approach always, all right? My father always said, they don't, if they don't know where you're from, then explain it to them. How and is it for you when I people think ask? Really yeah, I was I was just about to say I think it's fascinating because you have to learn to read the intentionality. So yeah. my experience, if it's somebody of South Asian origin asking me, it's yeah. because they assume I am and they want to include me. Yeah. And I feel really sad saying oh, I'm not Indian. I'm sorry. I wish I. I mean I'm not. Yeah. I wish I. And they'll say to me, but where are your grandparents from? And they'll say, no, also the same place. But your great grandparents. I'd say also I'm sorry, the same place. I can't. I'm sorry. And, but it's, it's inclusion, and I would say that's also the same. I have an Arabic name, Hadil. So whether you are Arab or whether you're a Muslim from, from the Far East, there's this, oh, you're a Muslim. And it's actually about inclusion. In, in, in Western culture, and among, when I'm asked um, candidly in white majority countries, it's about exclusion. Mm -hmm. It's generally, because I say London, but where are you really from? I mean, really, London. <laughs> <laughs> where are you from? Where, are you asking where my parents are from? My parents grew up in Egypt. And then you just get willfully misdirecting them, right? My parents grew up in Egypt, but we're actually Sudanese. But then my father lives across. Because you're, you're, you're peeling it's back also the layers of them, not The, the thing is, somehow. like what, what a friend of mine said, it's like you don't always feel to share your whole painful, yeah, maybe painful like uh, it, yeah. family history. That's... Yeah. So I, I just want to answer your question. Um, I, I feel the same. I feel that uh, nowadays uh, I wanted to ask Aziz um, because he said he's uh, from Afghanistan. And I, I, I've been in Afghanistan many times. And I wanted to ask him, you know, are you like Pashtun or Tajik or something? And, and start a conversation out of interest. And then I thought maybe he doesn't feel good about it, which makes me feel uh, suppressed. You know, why can't I ask? I mean, I, I, you know, for me, it's a simple question. Um, you know, I look at you and but I... But you're not asking the question out of exclusion. And I think, and, and but that is, as a white person, maybe sometimes like you have to prove your intention are good when you're asking it. Yeah. Uh, I don't yes, want to prove anything. An look, it's, it's a very simple thing. I mm. think I have asked you. When, uh, we but met why don't you want to prove your intentions are good? That's just being considerate. Yeah. 
Elis well, I, I like to keep things simple. <laughs> but things are not simple. But I, <laughs> well, for, maybe for you it's not simple. For me it's simple. When, I, when somebody asks me where are you from, I don't feel that somebody's trying to... Um, but you're white. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so you don't have to be sorry, do but I it's... Do I have to feel bad I'm white? No, no, I mean, but this is what always happens with white people when you, when you point to their whiteness. Sorry. They start being defensive okay. and saying, excuse me. You don't have to apologize. I, I, no. I, I think what's interesting is I'm happy to answer the question of where I'm from. I think it's when people don't take my answer and try to turn it into their version of my answer. And I don't actually mind when someone says, oh, but, you know, I'm curious, your family heritage. You know, if there's some ethnographic curiosity or geographical curiosity, <laughs> that's fine. But you can tend to, and, I, and I'm looking, I'm seeing people nod around the room. I feel like people in my situation, you can generally tell the intention. Yeah, and, and, this is and what I'm saying. You know, that's why I'm saying keep things response. simple. So when I ask you, I want to know because, you know, I'm curious or out of interest, maybe I, I want to ask you because I've never been to Sudan, uh, I so think, I want to know. We're embracing that I'm very curious. I'm I a think, journalist. Sure, and I think we're embracing that possibility, but I agree with Sunny. If I say to somebody, I'm from London, and they say, no, where are you really from? That's okay, okay, that's, <laughs> that's No, no, I understand, I understand. Welcome. I understand this part, but as I said, I want to keep uh, things simple. You know, like, I want to ask you, where are you from? And then we... I mean, I think, ah, yeah, I've been there, you know, this thing, and because, you know, I'm generally... But they never ask white a, people where you're from. They don't. They say you're from the Netherlands, but Americans, white Americans, they never say, no, but where are you really from? Like, what's... Yeah. Is it Scottish? Is it Irish? Is it... Do they? Oh, yeah. yeah? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Here's a white American. <laughs> do they ask you that all the time? With that framing, but I don't feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? Okay. Just, just to come out of, of this particular one, i just give you a story of my own experience. A Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, yeah. and most of the time when I'm stopped at the borders, they look at that passport, they find Afghani visa, mm -hmm. Pakistani visa, and North Korea. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you shouldn't have seen the shock on the immigration officers in New York who hold me for hours of interrogation. What are you doing in North Korea and Afghanistan, Pakistan, Palestinian, Arab, Muslim? It's complicated. So <laughs> when you go into that direction, it becomes ask officers, immigration officers. That question will be important to be asked in every country. The first impression you form when you land in that country, including Canada, by the way, who I also felt the same when I landed in Canada. But the people might be much more welcoming, much more diverse, much more flexible, but definitely, unfortunately, right now, this issue of nationalism and citizenship is summarized in a security uh, perspective rather than a cultural and, and you know, open-minded approach. Kiku, what do you think of this? You've been listening intensely. I want to hear it. I think that one of the earlier uh, ideals of home we mentioned was to be welcoming, to be hospitable. But in our public discourse, oftentimes we're not. We live in a very fractious time in which insults are hurled, nationalists, right-wing movements, um, uh, challenging people, crit criticizing people, the most unwelcoming from our own president you know, to, in the United States to immigrants. And so on the question of where are you from, to understand the many meanings of, of that question and I like the idea of seeing, being hospitable and open, the person's receiving the question, to what the intentions of the person are. And I think that that's the key. I wanted to uh, turn the discussion back to the idea we started with Odysseus and the idea of home not being a place but a, a journey. And from the Greek word uh, in the Odyssey, there, it was described, the return home was described as a nostos. Nostos means, it's a complicated word, but it means in the Odyssey, the return of the heroes from Troy, the sea journey home. But it also referred to the storytelling, to the poetry of that journey. And I think that that is so important in our understanding of home and storytelling, even if we're orphaned, even if we don't know our origins, as a form of agency in the world, as a form of action and speech, 
storytelling is very important, we begin to weave a story. And that story of, leave, of go, leaving home and coming home is also embodied in a word we're more familiar with, nostalgia, which has this Greek word in it, nostos, return home, <coughs> and aglia, which means, um, aglos rather, which means pain. The pain of losing home, of homelessness. And that can be the tangible pain of the refugee, of the immigrant, of somebody who is a victim of natural disaster, person who's orphaned. Um, but it's also part of the human condition. And what's interesting, I wanted to bring, read the, the origin of this word, nostalgia, um, because it was considered originally as a medical condition, <laughs> first documented in 1668 is, by a, in a dissertation by a Swiss medical student, Johannes Hofer, and then in kind of in, in officially recognized as a disease. And I'll read you from the 1833 Cyclopedia of Practical Medicine. <laughs> the concourse of depressing symptoms, which sometimes arise in persons who are absent from their native country, when seized with a longing desire of returning to their home and friends and the scenes of their youth. And this was considered a medical condition, particular to sailors and soldiers, um, to enslaved peoples, to convicts, and during the Civil War, it was documented by northern physicians, this intense disease. But I, what I want to rescue from our idea, the core meaning of nostalgia, is this Greek meaning, the ancient Greek meaning of the return and of the journey and the recognition in all of our lives of the pain and the suffering that just living a life, going back to as a human being, at home in the world, that our basic humanness is to understand that in a way there's a play between being a stranger and being a neighbor. And the most profound way that we can be hospitable to others is to recognize in us that we are strangers ourselves, that we've experienced strangeness and that that's part of our ancient history. We were strangers in a strange land. And the story which is core to Islam and Judaism and Christianity in the Bible of being a stranger in a strange land mm -hmm. of Abraham, welcoming the strangers, washing their feet, the three strangers who came to his tent in the desert and offering them a meal and offering them comfort. So I think if we think more deeply of the ways that we are strangers, we are also gonna understand other people's forms of estrangement in their own condition, in their own experiences, and have a more hospitable public discourse rather than one of insults and ignorance and the rejection of the immigrant. Uh, Rob. Rob has the mic. Rob has the mic here. We just go down. I, I want to add yes. something to that. Yeah, after. Okay. Uh, I was asked, or I heard the question about feeling comfortable as an American. So I had this fantasy that he actually threw me this box like a football receiver and I could go down on my knee. <laughs> so, uh, where, where I'm particularly the storytelling. It reminds me of our lunch yesterday. I have been grappling with the notion of home and it resonates with all of what I hear from you. About 2003, I was a recovering financial speculator and I sailed to Antarctica with nine people for 57 days. And there was an event where a wandering albatross came up and took off my glove and sat down with me. A book, a bird with about a 14 foot wingspan. I started petting it, I started crying, and I said, I can go home now. Two days later, as we were sailing across the Arctic Ocean, I was terrified. 
I said, I can go home, but I don't know where home is for me. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. That's a geography. About a year ago, I was planning a conference on the turmoil of race and inequality in Detroit, Michigan. And a gentleman I I ever get to. who's a photographer took me on a bike ride around the city of Detroit to shoot the graffiti of the city to use as backdrop. And he started telling me, because he gave me a bicycle that was created by a company called Shinola in honor of Muhammad Ali. And he said, you know why that bike? And I said, no. He said, because Muhammad Ali was a 12-year-old boy, and he had a bicycle, and it got stolen. And he got furious, and a lady took him to meet a policeman to write a report, and he said, young man, if you're going to be that angry and you're going to deal with people, you've got to learn how to fight. <laughs> so Muhammad Ali, by getting his bicycle stolen, was displaced into becoming a tremendous boxer and then a great spirit. So he said to me, in your life, what happened here in Detroit that nudged you? And I have no idea where this came from, but I stopped the bike and I looked at him and I said, what happened to me is I lost my innocence as a child. The 1967 riots still haunt me as I watch my father with a t-shirt tied to his radio antenna going downtown to serve in the hospitals while we're hearing gunfire in the background and tanks and sandbags are all over our street. Walter Ruther's death in an airplane, the race riots, the Vietnam War issues. And I felt as I watched Detroit's deindustrialization, the damage that was done there, like I watched a world, a media world, like an ABC News type world, not trying to explain what was happening, but trying to alleviate the anxiety of the American people that their dream was fragile. They created a cause which was called Corrupt Black Public Administration and Entrepreneurs Who Lost Their Mojo. And I looked at that, and I could start to understand why I was inspired to run the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I felt alone, but I stopped feeling that geography was my place. Geography had influenced my purpose, but my home was my purpose. And this year, Kiko, I was preparing, she knows my little daughter, Dylan, I was preparing a slide from the Odyssey of the Siren Songs of Temptation <laughs> to talk about fake news in Copenhagen. <laughs> and my daughter walked in and she said, Daddy, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to figure out where my home is. And she said, well, you need to listen to You Know Who You Are. And I said, what's that? She said, from Moana, the Disney movie, Dad. <laughs> and she puts it on. We have one of those Alexas. Alexa, play, a, you know who you are. She screams at it, and it starts to play. And then she looks at me and says, get the words on your phone. <laughs> so I sat there in front of this group with that slide from the Odyssey about my returning home. And they did a little typewriter graphic of the, of the song. The lyrics are very quick. I came across the horizon to find you. I know your name. They stole the heart from inside you, but it does not define you. It is not who you are. You know who you are. So as I looked at them, I said, the reason I'm here is to dissuade you from fixating on fake news. I don't believe in fake news because I grew up in a fake reality. And I'm home with you now, fighting these fake realities to get closer to our humanity wherever I am in geography. So. Adrian, thank you so much.
What I would like to do, if I may, we have less than 30 minutes left for, the, uh, for this wonderful discussion. I would love to be able to go around to get as many voices as we can. I'm going to urge you to, to uh, restrict your comments to less than a minute if we can, so that we can do a quick go around uh, and get more voices. I, I saw lots of people who wanted to say things. I'm going to start with you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, that was also, that's a very tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> I think going back to some of the earlier discussion about the question about where are you from, I have a similar story, I'm sure, to people on the stage as well as many people in this room and beyond this, these walls of I was born in England, I'm Canadian, I'm Indian, and I've lived in seven countries across four continents. So home to me is a very, very nebulous and ambiguous concept. So I'm curious more about when, given that there was so much discussion about values and the people being the definition of home, why, when the question comes, where are you from, A, do we not ask each other both, no matter what your color is and where we assume you're from, but B, why don't we also say, let me tell you who I am, and where I'm from is just a part of that. Thank you. That is, I, I think that is, the kind of, that is the kind of thing that is really interesting, and Sunny said something to us in the pre-conversation that I want to hear about, because mm -hmm. although you're define, you define yourself now as mm -hmm. filmmaking, the activist, trying to make things better in, in the Netherlands, in your home country, for the 50% of the people in the large cities who do not feel uh, they, they are not excluded. But you yourself are the product of something horrifying and traumatic, and you have lived through that. I want you to tell people that. Well. I don't really know, well, it does relate to the question of home. I'm currently writing a book about um, a family history. Uh, my father was a product of rape in the Second World War. So my, uh, well, what I suppose is my grandfather uh, was a Nazi who raped my, my, my grandmother. And um, she was, a anyway, <laughs> I don't know why, yeah. Of uh, course it's emotional. <clears throat> It has to be. You see, yeah, but I always thought I wouldn't. I wasn't really emotional over. about it, but now suddenly, like saying it in front of all these people. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, my <clears throat> grandmother was <laughs> so American. <laughs> anyway, so my grandmother was working for this man who was a, a, a mayor in a Nazi town in Germany, and he raped my grandmother, and my father was born. And uh, when my grandmother returned after the war, she couldn't raise my father because she remarried and this new husband, uh, they were living, they were very poor people. So she, I think she felt she needed to get married to survive. Um, and she left my father behind because my, that, my father's stepfather, well, it wasn't his stepfather, but anyway, this man didn't want my father there because he was not, he was a bastard child. So my father was raised by his grandparents, and that, of course, has shaped him and has shaped me. Mm -hmm. So, um, What could be more outside, you know, in a, in a society where the rules matter so much, where marriage matters, where family matters, all of those structures, you know, you He are, was the permanent outsider. He was the permanent outsider. Yes, and he, um, he was raised by his grandfather, who was a Marxist and a, an activist and a, a land worker. And uh, I think I get my activist genes from, from that, um, my great-grandfather. Um, and, um, yeah, so... It, it so you're not afraid of being outside. You're not afraid of being excluded in that sense because you grew up on a boat anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, w what I'm interested in is the idea of intergenerational trauma, that, the, uh, that traumas, uh, uh, there is this, this body of research is called epigenetic, genetics, whereby they say that the traumas uh, um, uh, uh, find a way to be part of your genes and, and get passed over uh, to next generation. And of course, that's very relevant to all of us living in uh, diaspora or people that ha are descendants of, of, of slavery and, uh, and for all women anyway. because we all, all women. We all, all women. Yeah. All suffered multiple traumas uh, generations back. Yeah. We have over here. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Chung. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I, um, I was a refugee from Vietnam in 1979. Um, 
I am, I stand up because I just am compelled to, to, to express myself because I generally don't come up here and speak in front of a group. But Adrian has a way to inspire me to do things I have never done before. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, I have a couple of shares. I, I, um, I keep hallucinating. In 1979, there was a forum like this where somebody get together and discuss these kind of issue, and that's how I come from Vietnam and got accepted in this wonderful country. Um, and all the blessing things that, that, that had happened to uh, Vietnamese refugees and, and have all these huge opportunity to be here and, and create the things that we create. The questions about home, um, my parents would never um, want me to talk about Vietnam. They never want to talk, talk to me me to anybody talk about Vietnam or, or even mentioning going back and that's the, that's kind of the story I grew up with so as many people know now this you know Vietnam is very different and a lot of people going back I also have a challenge of going back home and the, this subject is just sending goosebumps in my hand about home about the tragedies about the the memories, I mean, I, I don't know where the home is. And as I was contemplating all the questions around me, um, I came up with something I, I want to share is, I think home is the decisions. I mean, once we decide where your home is, then we have the responsibility to make the home the way we want it to be. Um, I live in Vancouver, Burnaby, a house like that, and I'm a busy person, and for the longest time, the lo that, that place that I live in is very transient because I, my, my, my energy, my, my focus is outside to make a living, to build my company and all of that stuff. So, and only recently when I had a moment to pause and I go, well, I should make this a home. And, and I start seeing weeds in the, in the gardens and all of that stuff that I haven't removed for so long. Likewise, the opportunity to be here and say, well, wow, Canada is a home. And the, um, two days ago, I witnessed the ceremony, and again, that, that emotion rushed to me and go, wow, this is my home. I mean, 20, uh, 30 years ago, I get the opportunity to swear in, and I, I haven't done much for the, ca the country, really. I was so focused on my, my, my own business, and where is my home now? I mean, Canada's my home, Burnaby's my home, Vancouver's my home, and, you know, and Vietnam was once my home. So all of these comes up for me, and I appreciate you listening to my share. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zara Salman, and I'm a high school student. I was born and I live in Toronto, but I, I also get the question a lot, where are you really from, when I say Toronto? and. When I answer, I'm from Pakistan, I feel like a fraud, just because I've only ever been there once when I was two, and I don't even remember it. It was for my uncle's wedding, and he lives in America now, so. <laughs> it's just, I, I also believe that home should be a decision, and I've been trying to decide where I want my home to be, and you come to realize that there aren't so many options, because my, I was always raised, my parents, I was privileged enough for them to say to me, well, you can always choose where you want to go. And I always wanted to go to Harvard. I wanted to study in Harvard. I wanted to graduate from Harvard. But recently, my parents say, no, you shouldn't go to America because your last name is Salman, we're Muslim, and Islamophobia is just so dominant right now, you wouldn't be safe. So. I started looking more in other countries and other places all over the world, and there always seems to be a reason why I shouldn't go, why my race, my skin color, my religion, that sometimes I don't even feel I identify with anymore. It's just, it's something I was raised with and something my parents do. It's stopping me from leaving Canada. And eventually, it feels like I'm trapped, and you start to hate the fact that you have to stay in a country and it stops feeling like your home. 
and it's just hard to to realize that it's not Canada's fault and it's not your own fault it's the fault of the values that we hold and the discrimination that everyone faces to to an extent and I just wanted to say that I believe that everyone belongs everywhere in the world and everyone should and all of you have such lovely stories and thank you for sharing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Doyen. I'm the Inclusion and Innovation Builder at Shopify. Um, one of the things I wanted to put forward is, is our national anthem. And so when you just reflect on the, the first line or the first two lines, so, O Canada, or home and native land. And in discussions over the past few weeks, someone said to me, what if we rewrote it as, O Canada, or home, the native's land? And we have not begun to discuss, and, and I'm so sorry that that perspective is missing from that table, that platform, where the indigenous perspective is. And I raise it because we shouldn't always need indigenous people to raise the fact that their voices are missing. It is incumbent on us, those of us who are all settler people, unless you're indigenous, you're a settler, whether you've been here for generations or new like me. And I think back to the question about where you're from, and is it simple? It absolutely is, but guess what? It discounts the importance of race and the role race plays in how we define what being Canadian is. In July, I was in the US for a wedding, my friend's wedding from McGill, and the stepfather of the groom came to me. He assumed I was someone else. I know all black people don't look alike, <laughs> but he assumed I was someone else. He asked me if I was born, and I said no, and he said, ah, so where are you from? And I said, I'm from Canada. And he said, oh, I've never seen a colored Canadian before. <laughs> now, everyone might jump on that and think, oh, my God, he just said the colored word. Like, how, it's like saying somebody's a nigger and like really going back to Jim Crow time. But I think back to, I'll forgive him for the colored bit. What he's saying to me is he's not exposed. He has an idea of what a Canadian is and that a Canadian is absolutely white. And the idea of multiculturalism and how we've begun to define diversity in this country hasn't really sunk in, even here and more so abroad. But I want you to step back and begin to think about how we're defining this discussion of home when we have not heard an indigenous perspective and think about the fact that these people have been here since time immemorial, we've taken away their home, and so they're seeing a completely different landscape. So imagine what it's like to live in your home but you can identify with nothing in it, particularly the most patriotic symbols like the flag and your anthem. So I just wanted to put that forward to you. You're quite, you're quite, you're quite right to, uh, to talk about the indigenous peoples in the article I wrote for the Globe and Mail last week, raising, uh, leading up to this uh, discussion, and I did not do it this morning because I went off on the Greek track the Greek trend. Um, uh, I talk about the fact that uh, we are based in, uh, in a, a land which has belonged to the native people and who the native people who welcomed us and made it possible for us to exploit it. They gave us everything and we treated them shabbily uh, uh, starting 100, 150 years ago and that we are now doing that redress and that we can't have an egalitarian society in Canada without realizing that a disproportionate amount of native people uh, do not are homeless. A disproportionate amount of native people do not have access to the same kinds of things that the rest of us do, and that is really important. And I think it's it's been underlying here for the last two days. The fact that we have not mentioned it in this particular one, I am remiss in that. Can I can I add yes, so just, oh, sorry. I, I just one more. Scully Scrago. I just want to acknowledge you. You won't go for your, your comments. Uh, my name is uh, Yoh Douglas, and uh, it's in English it's Andrea Christian. I, I was I spoke to to the issue yesterday. Uh, I, I work with a tremendous agency called Toronto Council for our Native Culture Center, and who I'm standing beside is a young lady who's Soto. Soto. We have Anishinaabe Kwe, we have we have uh, Afghanistan, and we have Haudenosaunee. And I think it's always really important. Again, thank you for that. That 
I was listening to the discussions on home and, and home and uh, home is really for us. And again, I speak to as being cognition. And when we say in the language and when you hear understand, when we stand, we say, and what I'm telling you is who I am. What I'm saying to you is introducing to you, not only to you, but to the universe and to creator. To be very proud of who I am, my name, my clan, my family, my nation, and the title that I hold. And it's always really important because, because we advance that first, so it becomes really difficult. The house, the house, the home are the same. The house is our, is our body. And, and we live in a land, and when you say, we say the longhouse, you imagine in your mind, I assume, that uh, it's a building. The longhouse is from east to west and everything in between. It's, it's how we take care of our body, how we take care of our home, and how we take care of the land. There's no difference, there's no separation. And, our, just, and as our identity, in, right out, identity in terms of Toronto Council Fire is really critical that we encourage individuals who come into the city, we encourage them to identify very clearly who they are and to be very proud and to wear, wear their, their, their nation, whether they're blonde or whether they're, they're not. We want them to be really proud and we instill in them that you need to speak to, to your language, to your identity and to ensure that you can wear it really proudly. And so listening to the dialogue around the table, I become really sad. And so t this morning I wasn't going to come because I have, a, I have to have eye surgery and I, th and I want to get my, uh, I get, had to have an appointment. I said, no, this is really important because as a young man across way, he said he's never really afforded that opportunity to speak in different forms. And, and so for me, it was really critical because my eyes, I can get them tested tomorrow. And that surgery is still going to take place. But I said, I wanted you to know who I am whether or not I look or don't look, but I will wear who I am. And to understand the color is Haudenosaunee. You know, the, the symbols that I wear are who we are as a people and what's really important. This particular time is what's really critical for us is that uh, we have our ceremonies and why we acknowledge the 13 moons and why we acknowledge through our ceremonies to, is to remind one another and those little ones, the little ones who who learn the language, the little ones who each year and this, the year thereafter when we have our Kaliwio, which, uh, and it travels from again from the east to the west uh, for our ceremonies is to ensure that our responsibility is to ensure that uh, our next generations and also to support these young people, to remind them who they are and they have ceremonies, they have a language and to never give that up. We ask, you know, in, in the language we ask, you know, who you are and so then it's really proud to give back to the universe to give that to give that description and you're portable I'm portable I come from somebody asked me where I'm from I say sky world because that's the beginning of my teachings and then I was being able to land here on this turtle island because of ancestors and then when I when I'm time when it's time for me to give up this shell or my house then I'll return with my spirit and I'll go back again to my homeland. But this is the same principle, which is my teachings, and I want to make sure that anybody and everybody that we come into contact, including your people, to be really proud of who you are. Please don't try to get into a melting pot like the United States of America. You know that the fact is you need to maintain your language, wear your color proudly, and, and if you get a chance to learn your language, then share it, because we have so much commonalities as we do as we do very little differences. So I just want to, again, acknowledge you uh, for allowing us and, and acknowledging these young people for, we give them every opportunity to make sure that, uh, that they're heard, they're present, and yesterday's exercise, they, they, they clearly demonstrated that they wanted to have their own table, and their table was about land and water, because that's who we are. So, I think, you know, go, you yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, hello. So a little bit earlier, you guys asked if there's people who feel as though maybe Canada isn't their home, and you guys are asking if there were Americans in the audience. But even as an Indigenous person, I don't even feel that Canada is my home. Canada wasn't my home when my mom was sent to residential school. Canada wasn't my home when my grandmother and my aunt were sent to boarding residential school, and they were abused, and they were there until they were 16. Canada wasn't my home and my grandmother's uh, brothers had to escape residential school and had to find their way back home without being caught. Canada wasn't my home when my schoolmate was part of the missing and murdered indigenous women's. 
Canada wasn't my home in my first year of college when I had a racist roommate. Canada, I feel, has never really been my home, and I don't know that Canada will ever really be my home. Yeah, I just want to uh, add a, a, a personal uh, experience. My second wife was, uh, her father was uh, uh, Afro-American and her mother was Danish. And she decided to come to Greece when she was 18 and she fell in love with Greece where a few years later we met, we, we got married and everything. And I remember she was very fanatic Greek. So in a, a lot of times, she was almost nationalist. Um, in a good way. Um, yeah, I mean, not nationalist, you know the band. Um, so, and I remember talking about this, and I said, what, what's wrong? I mean, you know, you can say that you are from there and there. I said, sure, when I have a conversation, and people ask me, a lot of times, I say, where are you from? Uh, from Greece. She always say, from Athens. And I said, you're not from Athens, come on, you know, you look. I said, okay, so let me tell you my story. And she would say this, her story. Um, but what I, I wanted to say and, uh, we, you know, with this story is that I think we, at the end of the day we can choose who, who we are and how we feel. That's why in the, the beginning I said in ancient Greece people were considered Greeks only if they had uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, spoke the language and uh, uh, had, uh, you know, all the, uh, the education and all these things. So I think in our world today, well, in our at least Western democratic civilized world, whatever, um, we have the choice to decide who we are and where are we from. And then if we wanna continue our conversation, you know, we can say, ah, yeah, and my father is from there. I mean, my, my grandmother, as I said in the beginning, is from, is an ethnic Greek, I think, <laughs> or she thinks, from Turkey. My, my father has red, he died, he had red hair and blue eyes. It's not very Greek. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and to finish with this, I, I have a very good friend uh, who uh, is an author, in, uh, he's a Scottish. He has blonde, uh, red hair, blue eyes, very kind of uh, pinkish face and all this. And uh, one day he went to have a DNA test. And he wrote me a, a, an email back and he said, guess what? I'm 20% Greek and I'm 10% Arab. And I'm 15% Asian and 30% German and whatever. So, you know, that, that's why I said in the beginning, we are all, uh, you know, members of the same community and it's called uh, Planet Earth. Thank Can you. Can I, um, oh, I didn't want to. Okay. So well, I just, then, yeah, then. I just wanted to respond that I think the idea of choosing your identity is done from a position of privilege. A lot of people uh, don't have that choice, I think. And uh, when we're, because it's been a, like, <laughs> I'm always, um, well, anyway, I want to say it's been a really beautiful session, which is quite emotional. And, but just to get to, to make a political analysis, like in the Netherlands, there has been some research that show, like, when you look at how uh, news is being reported, that whenever someone with a bicultural background that is Dutch, does something good, they're called Dutch. When they do something bad, they're called Surinamese Moroccan. So if there if there is like talk of a crime, they're being called uh, Moroccans are blah 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 blah. And when uh, they're winning a sports award, they're called Dutch. So I think that is a, a, a way through which we exclude people that belong to the same country. Um, I have two comments over yes. here, Adrian. Uh, I, I'm just going to go around here. Okay. Sorry, um, I, I mean, I, I felt really struck to respond, and I, you have to f permit me for, for, for not remembering the names of the two young women. Um, yeah. sorry, so Zara. Zara and, sorry, I, at the back. I, I your didn't name? catch your name. Christina. Christina. I was really struck by, by your sense of not feeling of uh, Canada and feeling excluded more broadly by your... Um, by the rising Islamophobia. And I think one of the, one of the real challenges we face, I, mean, I wanted to find something that might be hopeful or optimistic going forward, which is tough, right? But one of the things I would say is, a lot of the rising xenophobia that we're seeing, right, and this conservatism, you know, I'd say there's two things. First of all, it's, 
It's people that believe the best days in their countries are in the past, mm -hmm. right? I'm a progressive, I'm not a conservative, because I think for people like me, the future has to look better than the past. There's no way that to be black or to be female, to be from any minority, to be gay, to be disabled, is to say, I want to live in some idealized past. It's not true. We need to live in a future that respects our rights. So I, I, I look to the future. The second thing I want to say about this kind of idealization of the past, it's one thing to remember Syria, right? It's one thing to remember Syria or Egypt, but the past that they're talking about when they talk about Brexit, for example, never existed. We have to stand up to these narratives about this amazing, you know, make America great again, make America, the, what they're talking about is in the mind, it never existed. Let's be very clear about Britain post Brexit, unless they reoccupy one third of the world's land service, they will not be great again. They will never be what they were unless they colonize people again. It's finished. You know, that world has finished. So I don't know if it gives hope, but I do think that, you know, the notion of international law, the notion of international rights, why we're fighting, what we're fighting for, and what we're fighting against is a fundamental belief that the future is better. And I think all of us have an obligation to stand up and fight against these narratives that, you know, somewhere in the past was a country where we didn't all die of cholera at 10, or we weren't all, you know, kind of discriminated against. Somewhere there was a place where there were jobs for everyone, there was work for everyone, and we all skipped through fields of milk and honey. It never existed. It never existed. That could exist in the future, but it did not exist in the past. And I think we really have to fight for, for, for all of us um, to, to, what was it we said at the beginning, right? Like, home is where I get to be Absolutely. me. Home is where yeah. you get to feel like a citizen, and you get to feel like you can go wherever you want. Okay, you know, I will take this forward. Thank you very much. By suggesting the following. The story is one. If you listen to what we have been talking for the last one and a half hours here in this hall, basically each one of us is giving his version of one story. The fact that there is no justice, the fact that there is the system in a way or another is interfering, Politics is putting a lot of pressure and generating a lot of barriers and a lot of complications for us. Wherever you are, and, and this is what I have reached now. I'm living in a part of the world where it is the most complicated at this moment in time, to say the least. We are killing each other. We are eradicating each other. We have xenophobia. We have racism. We have sectarianism. We have religious complications, ethnicities, everything at this moment in the Middle East, where I have come from. But always I have the following statement I tell the youth in the Arab world, that the future, you should guard the future. If we cannot have a brilliant present, but at least save the future from being hijacked and save the future from being punished by the reality that we are living in. Build the future, at least imagine it. Imagine the future in a nice way. We are privileged right now, our, your generation more than mine, you are privileged that you have internet. Before, we were not even, even able to, to express our thoughts and ideas to the world. Wherever you are now, you can sit and become part of a universal struggle for justice, for freedom, for equality, fighting xenophobia, Islamophobia, racism, sectarianism, whatever you call it. So Sexism. do it, do it, do it. Don't stop only by complaining. I think we need to have that kind of international networking that we can save our future from being shaped by our present because the present is not the most brilliant present that the humanity has established. Thank you very much. Kiku. I give Kiku. Kiku's got the last word. I wanted to go back to the eloquent statements made by the, um, the mother and Christine or Christina? Christina. Uh, that one is this idea of uh, Christina spoke to the pain and the suffering of being a stranger in your own home a stranger in your own land, having to explain and tell your story Thanks, is an act of courage and it involves 
enormous pain. And that is the connection between the story of the Odyssey and your story in the sense that to that there is in the return to home or maintaining home and bringing it into the world over and over again and its spiritual meaning involves suffering and pain. And I think that that is a very different, we may all experience it in different ways, but to be a stranger in your own home or to have people in your own home not understand you, have to tell the story, as I said, is a, a difficult and courageous act that I think we're all acknowledging. And as far as I see, I know Canada has a long way to go, but you're so much farther ahead than the United States. We are not even beginning to tell the story of our indigenous people. So that's one thing. And then the idea of the return to home, again, is part of all of our journeys. And it takes different forms. Um, I like very much what you said that you bring, you have to think of the future and where you're going, but also the past and especially its resonant spiritual meanings are alive in the stories we tell. It's not, the past is never really past and to acknowledge home in memory and stories, we bring it into the present. We give it birth into the world over and over again and for somebody like me who was taught all the way back to the, our most ancient past, um, not to mention Spain, which would be a more modern past, the idea of, again, these biblical stories, these foundational stories, is to say that we must be reflective, again, about home more than a place is a deeply human journey. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Before the panel uh, leaves,